Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Voices from Black 47, Famine Emigrants in Their Own Words, The Great Famine, Part 11. 170 years ago, something tragic yet nonetheless phenomenal began to take shape in Ireland. Faced with what seemed to be inevitable starvation and death, huge numbers decided they could no longer survive in Ireland. During the five years between 1846 and 1851, 1.25 million Irish people would pass through the English port of Liverpool alone, many of them on their way across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. This podcast is the first of several throughout the series which looks at the story of Irish famine emigrants. Using letters from 1847, this episode voices the experience of people preparing to leave Ireland, fleeing starvation and disease. To make the episode, I spent several days in the archives of the National Library of Ireland, sifting through thousands of letters, and for the first time since the Great Famine, you can hear the words of these famine emigrants. The letters are read by Claire Ryan, Jamie Goldrick, Tom McDermott and Dave Lorden. To begin though, I want to explain a bit about emigration in Ireland, because those who fled Ireland during the Great Famine were by no means the first. Indeed, they were only following in the footsteps of earlier Irish migrants. Ireland, in the grand scheme of things, is a pretty small place. An island on the north coast of Europe with a population of around 6 million people, smaller than many cities. Yet the island punches above its weight in terms of the popularity of its culture. This is primarily due to emigration. For centuries, Ireland's most consistent export has been its people, and today there is perhaps somewhere in the region of 100 million people across the globe who claim Irish descent. The story of this emigration is not necessarily what we imagine it to be though. When we think of the origins of Irish communities across the globe, our mind immediately turns to the Great Famine. That this was a seminal moment is undeniable, but it is not the starting point by any means. And to understand famine emigration in Ireland, we need to take a look back at least a generation before the Great Hunger began. While emigration has been a feature of life in Ireland since at least the late Middle Ages, in the 30 years before 1845, the numbers leaving the Ireland began to grow rapidly. One million people had left between the years 1815 and the first failure of the potato crop in 1845. Sizable Irish communities had already been established long before the famine. In Liverpool, for example, there were 50,000 Irish-born people living in the English port in 1841, making up one-fifth of the population. These people are somewhat forgotten today, given the vast numbers who would follow them and take flight during the Great Famine. But these early migrants still played an important role in the story of famine emigration. While they established Irish communities abroad, these early emigrants also continued to influence life back home in the early 19th century. While a letter from Australia took four months to reach Ireland, many emigrants, eager to keep in touch, wrote home frequently. Some letters contained what was little more than idle gossip. This, for example, is an extract from a letter written in Melbourne, Australia, to my hometown of Castlecomer. Dear Parents, I write these few lines to you concerning Annie Bradley. She is living with a man not married, a few miles in the bush. Her poor brother do not know what to do. He do not go near her, nor speak to her. While people back in Castlecomer undoubtedly gossiped about Anne Bradley's life in Australia, other letters had a more profound impact, particularly as the famine began to make life more and more difficult. In 1846, another person from Castlecomer, James Purcell, living in Geelong, Australia, wrote to Bridget Brennan back home, asking her to join him. The letter was written in August 1846 and took 165 days to reach its destination in Castlecomer, arriving on January the 25th, 1847, to a town where conditions were growing increasingly desperate under the impact of the famine. Letters like James Purcell's would prove pivotal for those contemplating emigration to escape the horrors of starvation. Australia was a gruelling journey away from many migrants, but the picture portrayed in James Purcell's letter 
was appealing. This country is real good now and likely to continue, so I think there is not a better country in the world and no hard work for man or woman here. Wages men's up to £30 and will very soon be more than £40. Women's up to £20 and £25. He went on. This is also a fine climate. It's the finest winter climate in the world and also a very handsome country. The contrast between this idyllic portrayal of life overseas and the reality of life on the ground in Ireland by 1847, where thousands were starving to death, is stark. With such alluring descriptions being sent back by emigrants and the very fact that emigration was already well established as a common enough experience long before the famine, it is not surprising that huge numbers made the decision to leave Ireland as starvation set in and life became unbearable in Black 47. However, the sheer numbers that began to flee Ireland stunned the world and even now are hard to fathom. Through 1847 alone, 220,000 people left and by the end of 1852, the number who had emigrated was around 1.5 million people, somewhere in the region of one in six of those who had been living in Ireland in 1845. A famous letter to the Cork Examiner described the situation in 1847. The emigrants of this year are not like those of former ones. They are now actually running away from fever, disease and hunger. This was an exodus of biblical proportions, very similar to the flight of war refugees from Syria today. And like refugees in the 21st century, our ancestors were willing to risk extreme danger in order to escape. As early as January the 21st, 1847, the Sligo champion was reporting a steamer full of emigrants had left the port of Sligo. A departure this early in the year would never have normally been considered, as the risks posed by winter storms was too dangerous. However, while they were undoubtedly desperate, the profile of those running from hunger, as the Cork Examiner put it, were not necessarily the people we might expect. For example, there was not a direct correlation between how extreme famine conditions were and how high the rate of emigration in a given area was. Conditions in Roscommon and Mayo were dire and the numbers leaving were extremely high. But in Cork, where as we saw deprivation in some parts was absolutely terrible, emigration was comparatively low. Other factors were actually more important than conditions on the ground, namely money. If you didn't have some money at least, you couldn't leave, no matter how desperate you were. Cormac O'Grada, one of the leading historians of the Great Hunger, has described Irish famine emigrants as mostly people of modest means. They were not the absolutely destitute. While this might run contrary to the popular narrative, O'Grada's point actually makes sense when we think about it. The truly destitute, those who could not even afford to eat, could not have afforded a ticket fare. The cheapest passage across the Atlantic was 50 shillings, the price of feeding a family for a month. While we might know lots about the profile of famine emigrants, what travel conditions were like, which is something I will address in future episodes, and the lives they forged in places like the USA, we know surprisingly little about the lives they had led back home in Ireland. The voices of emigrants have often been lost as they were scattered across the globe. This is hardly that surprising. They were, in most cases, desperate and had little reason, opportunity or time to record why they were leaving Ireland. So who exactly were these people? Well, obviously, it's far beyond the scope of a series like this to look at all aspects of Irish emigration during the famine. But for the rest of this show, I am going to focus on a collection of letters preserved in the National Library, which give us an insight into one group of migrants. They give us a unique view into who Irish famine emigrants were, why exactly they were leaving, and what they were leaving behind. Some were, as you might expect, very desperate people, but surprisingly, others less so. The letters themselves are from my hometown of Castlecomer, County Kilkenny, and due to unusual circumstances, thousands of prospective emigrants recorded their plight as they prepared to leave Ireland forever. The letters exist because the local landlord, the Wandersford family, were willing to pay for some of their tenants to emigrate to Canada as they sought to reduce the numbers of people living on their estate in an effort to make the lands more profitable. This saw thousands of tenants write to the family in 1847 alone, pleading to be sent overseas as they wanted to escape the terrible conditions gripping Ireland. 
Before we hear their stories, there is some background information to life in Castle Comer worth bearing in mind. The letters are generally addressed to one of three people, Charles Wandesford, his wife Lady Lucy Wandesford, referred to as Madam, or their eldest son, John. Their estate consisted of the town of Castle Comer and about 20,000 acres of land. It was somewhat unique as it lay on extensive coal deposits, so many people in the area worked as miners in coal pits, something that is mentioned in some of the letters. If you want to know more about life in Castle Comer, its coal mines and the Wandersford family, I've made a mini-series of podcasts available in the back catalogue. Finally, the often stiff and formal tone used in the letters illustrates the hierarchical nature of life at the time where landlords considered themselves superior to their tenants in every way imaginable. This goes some way to explain the often sycophantic tone used by the tenants when addressing them. To begin, I've selected three letters to try and give you a sense of the conditions forcing people in places like Castle Comer to consider leaving their homes forever. The first letter is from a man called Pierce Wallace begging the landlords, the Wandersford family, for blankets. Sir, Pierce Wallace of Crute, an old resident of your honour's estate, takes the liberty of stating his great distress. He has three orphan children for whom he can scarcely obtain food. He expects your honour will be so good to order him some night covering as his children and himself are almost famished with hunger, cold and hardship. Petitioner will be bound to pray for your honour's prosperity. January the 7th, AD 1847. The coal mines dotted across northeastern Kilkenny around Castle Comer attracted large numbers of people to the area. But in a world without social security, when people were no longer able to work for one reason or another, they were left destitute. When the famine set in, they found themselves in a precarious position, like John Farbrush describes in this letter. Honourable Sir, the application of John Farbrush of Monrine South. I am a poor old collier, now unable to labour. My forefathers were reared on your honour's estate. I am at present lying sick have no hopes of living ten days longer on this miserable world. I am obliged to live in a hovel at the coal pit myself, and an aged mother who is eighty, lying sick, suffering the greatest destitution, pity our distress, and order some little relief. However, it was not just people like Farbrush who found themselves facing extreme difficulties by late 1847. Others, further up the social scale, increasingly found themselves in serious trouble. The next letter is from a man called John Wilson, who cannot bring himself to admit he can no longer pay rent. But at the end of the letter, this is exactly what he's referring to when he talks of embarrassing circumstances. Kill, February 1st, 1847. Sir, it being now more than seven years since I became tenant to your honour, and having endeavoured hitherto to pay my rent with credit, although meeting with and overcoming many difficulties arising, chiefly from the failure of crops, but especially these last three years the potato crop, almost entirely failed, which obliged me to make use of oats for the maintenance of my family, I expended a large amount of money and labour in improving the land, and which your honour was kind enough to consider, in that you reduced the rent." Having no available means to pay a half-year rent which has been called, and for which my cattle have been impounded, unless I sold the only means by which, with God's blessing, I hope to be able to make my rent, my dairy cattle to sell, which must inevitably place me in embarrassed circumstances. I remain your humble servant, John Wilson. Wilson was clearly richer than the men who wrote the first two letters. Along with his cattle he grew oats and potatoes. Further to this, the letter was written on fine and quite expensive paper. However, no matter how high his social standing in the community was, it made little difference. His plea fell on deaf ears. John Wandersford, who reviewed the letter, scrawled, I cannot interfere with the collection of rent across his plea. What happened to Wilson is unknown. From these letters, though, it's clear the people of Castlecomer were suffering by early 1847, and given the Wandersfords were willing to pay for emigration, they were soon inundated with a deluge of letters from people asking to be sent to what they called America. 
When Tennant used the term America, they did not mean the United States, but rather Canada, where the Wandersfords chose to send their tenants. The reason behind sending people to Canada was a financial one. A fare to Canada cost 50 to 60 shillings, while a fare to the United States cost 70. The cheaper rate to Canada was because the Canadian authorities had a laxer approach to regulations compared to those in the United States. The following letters offer insights into what proved to be the tipping point for Irish emigrants, each of whom had their own story and their own reason for wanting to leave. The first letter is from a man called Dennis Bow, who appears to have been illiterate as he did not write his own plea. While the details of his case are scanty, his was a common story. He was extremely desperate after being served what was called his notice. This meant he was about to be evicted. Bo had no interest in trying to fight for his home, often the stereotypical impression we have of Irish evictions in the 19th century. By 1847, he, like so many others, just wanted to leave Ireland. Sir, Dennis Bo of Donegal, that lives on Ballyragged Road in a house that was built on Thomas Doyle's land, has three in a family. Sir, he has got a notice. Will you consider and send him and family to America? March 29th, 1847. Dennis Bow was by no means the only one who couldn't pay his rent. Many of the tenants in Castlecomer, as we saw with John Wilson, were falling into arrears. However, some letters detail people in a far worse situation. Those already on the brink of starvation, like James Kelly. Sir, I have 11 in family without any means of support. I hope you will order me to be sent to America. I have laboured on your father's estate for the last 19 years. And if you do not take into consideration, myself and family must of necessity die of starvation. I have no alternative. Necessity has forced me to apply to you, and I hope for a favourable reply. James Kelly, Money in Row, March 11th, 1847. The opportunity to emigrate was not something a man like James Kelly would normally have been able to do without the support of his landlord. Even travelling to England would probably have been far beyond his means. In most communities across Ireland, it was people like Kelly who were most at risk from starvation. There were others, however, who were not totally destitute, or at least they had assets, but the famine was also pushing them to the brink, as we can see in this letter from Patrick Ryan. He is looking to sell up his lease. The famine had destroyed his hopes of paying rent. Sir, let me beg you will be pleased to allow me to sell my land, as it is impossible for me to stand any longer. I am delicate in detailing my grievous distresses, but if you do not allow me to get something for my ground or send my family and myself to America out of this country, I am totally ruined. Unable as I am to sow even one stone of a grain or any kind of crop to pay your rent or any other kind of demand, I am respectfully Patrick Ryan. The next letter is from a farmer called Fred Bradley and it has a somewhat tragic tone to it. Despite inheriting a lease from his uncle, Alex Bradley, who had died, he, like so many others, just wanted to leave Ireland in 1847. While it's not entirely clear, judging on taxation rolls from the 1820s, the Bradleys of Crutton Cluck may well have been quite wealthy at one point. However, the famine was not just affecting those who were dependent on potatoes. It was turning into an economic catastrophe, dragging many people, even those who were once well off, into destitution. Here Fred is willing to give up what would once have been a much sought after lease on the farm at Crutton Cluck. Crutton Cluck Farm. Honourable sir, I am, as you are well aware for the last few years, held the farm as above named. Now that surmising from the lease having become void by the death of my uncle Alex Bradley, I wish to state that I have no objection to resigning the farm, but having a young and helpless family left, I am inclined to immigrate and throwing myself on your clemency and appealing to your sympathy, you will be pleased to give some help in furtherance of my attentions. I ask it not as matter of right, but as an act of benevolence from you for which in compliance shall be ever gratefully acknowledged. I have the honour to be, sir, Fred Bradley, your obedient servant, March the 1st, 1847. While the Wandersford family were willing to pay the boat fare to Canada, many of their tenants still found themselves facing major obstacles even after they had secured a place on a boat paid for by their landlord. By 1847, many Irish people had pawned everything they had to survive and literally had no clothes to emigrate in, while others still could not even get to a port. 
This next letter is from a widow who was in dire straits even though she had tickets for Canada for her family. She had no money to buy clothes or food for the voyage. Ships rations were notorious at the time and she knew her family would not be able to survive on them alone. So she wrote to the Wandersfords begging for extra aid. Sir, your applicant returns thanks for granting her request to be sent to America. She now prays your honour to take her care into consideration and grant her two pounds in addition to the usual sum, as she and family are quite destitute of clothing, and they would, after buying necessary articles, have to go to sea without any other than the ship allowance, a thing they dare not venture to do. She begs your indulgence for the trouble she has given your honour and prays an answer as soon as convenient. She will ever pray, Widow Brennan. I find something really tragic and desperate about her final words, she will ever pray. While it is only a turn of phrase, it does highlight the fact that she, along with many others, promised the Wandersfords prayers in return for help because they had nothing else to offer them. Next we hear a story of a slightly different nature, that of an infirmed emigrant couple, granted passage, however, in order to escape the famine, James Byrne and his wife would need to walk 60 miles to the port of Dublin, while most impoverished people would have walked this. Byrne himself had been injured in a mining accident, while his wife was ill, so neither could walk that far. Coon, March 30th, 1847. Sir, I am returned for America, but unfortunately my wife is reduced to a very bad state of health in so much as she is confined to bed, and I am unable to pay her fare from here to Dublin together, with which I am myself to travel in consequence of falling before at the pit. Under such circumstances I hope you will consider my case, and order me free passage from here to Dublin, as I and my wife are both unable, whether to travel it on foot, or pay for a conveyance. I am your humble applicant, James Byrne. While these letters detail the desperate condition of many emigrants before they departed Ireland, the letters in the Wanderstreet papers in the National Library also catalogue a different aspect to emigration, one we don't often think about too much, the impact on those left at home. In 1847 alone, 1,957 people left the Wanderstreet estate in Castlecomer on the assisted emigration scheme. The impact on the community was substantial. Many left behind found themselves in extreme difficulty due to this emigration. Most, if not all, emigrants were impoverished, but they were trying to start a new life, so they did whatever they could to amass as much money as possible before they departed. Naturally, some left debts in their wake. This next letter is from a middleman who sublet lands, but one of his tenants who owed him rent was about to leave and not pay up. Sir, E. Whitehead and myself has a decree for William Kavanagh of Tortain for rent and arrears of rent due to us. He is now selling his land and has sold all his effects. May I ask your honour to give orders to him to pay us? I would not get one shilling from those that is selling land. I am, sir, your obedient servant. John Draper This next letter is in a similar vein, but it's highly unusual as it is one of the few pleas where the complainant seems openly angry at their landlord, the Wandersfords. The letter lacks the courtesies used in other correspondence. However, having endured the hardships of the famine, it's easy to see why this woman would be so incensed. Sir, I have on three different times applied to you to be sent to America, and you have as often refused me. And in consequence of my refusal, none of my family can go but my husband and my eldest son, which was my only support. Thus I am left without one who is able to earn one shilling for me. Now there are some persons going to America who you are sending that are in my debt and I hope you will not allow them to cheat me, as you would not send myself, and I will be in the deepest destitution. This is my only and last request. The following are the names of people cheating me. Edward Morn, Thomas Butler, John Byron, James Burke. I am your humble applicant, Alyssa Kelly. From the letter, it's obvious the Wandersfords had granted Eliza's husband and eldest son passage to America. Presumably they had done this in the hope that they in turn would earn money themselves to pay the fare of the rest of the family. However, for Eliza back home, she clearly faced major problems. Not only was she separated from her husband, but others were now leaving Castlecomer owing her money. 
That said, while emigration did create major difficulties for some back home, it did offer opportunities to others left in Castlecomer, even some who were extremely poor. In this next letter, George Wright clearly didn't want to leave Castlecomer and wanted another shot at making a living in his hometown, even in the midst of famine. March 29th, 1847. Sir, it is utterly impossible for me to attempt to live in this country on my small means with only a quarter of an acre in land to help me and my family. As many little holdings will be falling into your hands, I pray you will enlarge me by moving me to another place. John Kennedy will be leaving his holding in Cool Bon, which would suit me very much and would enable me to live on in my native place. If you do not think well of this, I hope you will assist me to leave this country. I am, sir, your obedient servant, George Wright. To finish, though, I want to look at what is an enduring impact of emigration, be it during the famine or even today, and that is the breakup of families. This final letter is sad in tone as it details what seems to be a family on the verge of being divided. Those left behind suffered the double blow of remaining in Ireland facing the consequences of famine, but also then losing family members. While today we have Skype, Facebook and relatively cheap airlines to stay in touch, the reality was in the 1840s, once someone emigrated, the only contact you would have was through letters. March 10th, 1847. I have got my answer out of the office stating that two single brothers ought to be well able to live at home. But as our brother and his family got their answer from your person to prepare for America, and as they are living in the other end of the house in which we reside, we are most anxious to go along with them, for if we get work two days of the week, we are generally idle the other three days. We are hoping your honour will kindly consider us, and let us go out, for we are in great distress and want, and your petitioners are ever found to pray for your honour. Patrick Connery, Darby Connery. For the Connery brothers who wrote this letter, if their appeal was rejected, they would probably never see their brother, his wife and their nieces and nephews again. These are only a tiny sample of the emigration letters from Castle Comer. I could make an entire podcast series on them alone. They do give us an insight into people from Castle Comer hoping to emigrate and the problems they faced. But people up and down Ireland were experiencing very similar difficulties in the late 1840s. This episode is only the first on emigration. There will be several more throughout the series, but I felt it was important to include something at this point in the series to try and keep the chronology of the podcasts in line with history. In the next show, I will return, as promised, to the narrative of the famine, looking at the opening of soup kitchens in early 1847, and I'll also touch on the story of the famine in Dublin. Before I sign off, I want to thank Claire Ryan, Jamie Goldrick, Tom McDermott and Dave Lorden for reading the letters. Don't forget you can get the bonus material today by becoming a patron of the series at Patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Irish podcast that's Patreon dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, Slán. Slán.